Hello and welcome to India Speak, the podcast by the Center for Policy Research. My name is Navroz Dubash. Uh, I'm a professor at the Center for Policy Research. And today we're going to talk about the recently released report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 3, that is the working group that looks at mitigation solutions uh, the way forward. And this report follows two other reports uh, by the IPCC, as it is known, one on science and one on impacts. The idea really of these reports is to provide a policy relevant uh, assessment of the knowledge base on climate solutions to inform governments. And so it is something uh, that is uh, awaited uh, by policymakers around the world. And this is a cycle that occurs every five or six years. And today uh, to discuss this report uh, with us is a fellow author of the report, Shonali Pachori. And Shonali is a research group leader of the new Transformative Institutional and Social Solutions Group at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, IASA, which is one of the leading global think tanks focused on issues of energy, climate change, uh, and so on. And Sonali has, has years and years of experience um, uh, working in particular on innovation uh, around technology and, uh, and social innovations for inclusive human development particularly focused on people without access to basic infrastructure and services. So Shanali brings a lot of salient expertise from the IPCC, but also uh, expertise that's salient to India. Welcome to this, uh, this show, uh, Dr. Pachorio. If you don't mind, I'll call you Shanali. Thank you, Navroz, if I may call you Navroz. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I'm delighted to be part of this. Thank you. That's great. Uh, now, now, as, as Shanali, you and I have had a chance to converse quite a bit over the last few weeks, uh, both of us as uh, authors uh, on this report, uh, you on the chapter on trends and me in the chapter on policies and institutions. And maybe it would be useful for the readers to, uh, or rather the listeners, to understand a little bit more of what this process was like at a personal level, both the, the drafting of the report and the more recent approval process, which is quite unusual for global reports of this sort. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, I'd be happy to. So actually it was my first time uh, being an IPCC author. So it was all completely brand new to me. Uh, I mean, I have several colleagues who have done this for several years now. And of course they informed me and advised me and were very supportive of my decision to join uh, this effort. Um, and I, I found the writing process quite, um, quite, quite easy in some ways. Uh, I mean, of course, there's a lot of literature to sift through and there are rigorous uh, review processes to, to do, to undergo. But overall, I found it uh, quite rewarding. Um, but I found the, <laughs> the approval process more challenging. Uh, I guess being the first time, uh, I found it quite intense and exhausting, actually. Uh, maybe that was partly because of the virtual setting of this, these meetings. Um, I had expected questions on sort of clarifications of what was in the summary for policymakers and also questions on why certain elements had been lifted to the summary and others had not. But I was totally unprepared for questions that were kind of, you know, asking about the basis of the underlying science. Just assume that since this is an assessment of peer-reviewed literature, which itself has gone through review processes, that the underlying science would not be questioned. So that was quite disturbing for me. Uh, but what I found really inspiring was the commitment and the dedication and you know, the overall support that you saw between the scientists, the technical support unit and the Bureau of the IPCC. I mean, I found that incredibly inspiring. Right. As you say, it's, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was quite a uh, uh, challenging process. I think it would be good for the listeners if we just rewind a little bit and, and explain the scale and scope of this. So maybe I'll take a second to do that. You know, this was, as, as, as uh, I think we've been involved in this, uh, Shanali, for three years or so. So it's a three-year-long process with multiple meetings. I think six different author meetings 
uh, four of which were virtual because of the COVID crisis, during which we reviewed probably tens of thousands of uh, published peer-reviewed articles. And then we also, each of us had to address thousands of comments. So in my chapter, I know that we had 1400 comments in the last round and there were three rounds of review and we had to respond to each of those comments. So while the writing was in a sense, you know, more predictable, it was, it, I think it was also a challenge. Just before we leave this, this topic though, I think it might be worth also highlighting, um, and I'll come back to you in a second to describe this further, what is meant by an approval plenary here or an approval process. So the IPCC is unusual among these kinds of global reports in that it is written by scientific uh, authors, but it is then approved line by line by governments who are in conversation with the authors about the policy relevance of the findings and how you present these findings in a way uh, that, is, uh, that, is policy, uh, that is policy relevant. So with that, with that backdrop, maybe Shanali, you can take another minute to kind of paint a picture of what an, what an average day at the approval plenary uh, uh, looks like, you know, the text up on the screen and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, thank you, Navroz. I should have probably given a little more background before diving into my impressions. Uh, but um, as you rightly say, this is quite a unique process because basically the summary for policymakers is approved line by line, word by word. And so in a you know, typical plenary uh, meeting, there will be, you know, delegations from all across the globe who then kind of start examining each sentence and uh, questioning uh, why that sentence is there, uh, what it really means, providing, uh, perhaps asking for questions to clarify certain elements about it. Um, again, asking questions about why this sentence and not another, for instance, why you know it's considered important enough to be in the summary. Um, but then, you know, as I mentioned, there were also questions regarding the underlying science, which I found quite astonishing. Yeah, yes, and I, I think I think that I think that the fact that this was a uh, a Zoom-based process uh, probably added to the nature uh, uh, of the challenge because any sort of clarifications about the underlying science was so much harder to explain because you couldn't just have an, an informal conversation with the, with the delegates and, uh, and so on. So it was all in a very structured, formal, uh, formal process. Maybe we can, um, we can turn to telling uh, the listeners a little bit about the report. And I think your chapter is really important because it sets the stage uh, for what follows by talking about the broad trends. So uh, perhaps you want to sort of share some of the, the big picture trends in terms of emissions, the distribution of those emissions, um, and, and maybe some of the things that you particularly, uh, you know, found noteworthy that you, you know, that you think are worth uh, a listener being aware of. Yeah, sure, Navroz. So as you rightly said, uh, the chapter that I contributed to is kind of trends and drivers, so kind of sets the stage for much of what follows in the report. And I think one of the big picture uh, messages that came out from that chapter is that global net anth anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions during the decade 2010-2019 were higher than any previous time in recorded human history. Now, this is kind of really disturbing, uh, given that we need to be on a trajectory that's very different from this. Uh, and um, I, you know, uh, I really think that um, one of the key things that came out was the fact that, uh, you know, not only are uh, emissions of all major gases rising, have been rising since 2010, but then also in every sector, we've seen a rise in emissions uh, globally. And uh, this again is really, you know, contrary to what we should be seeing uh, across the board. Uh, the good news in some sense is that the average annual rate of growth between 2000 and 2019 in greenhouse gas emissions has slowed compared to the previous decade. So, you know, that's uh, a somewhat good, piece of news. Uh, but I mean, of course, um, we see huge differences in terms of how different regions have been contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the section that I was particularly 
sort of contributing to were looking at some of these regional, national, and household level differences in emissions patterns. So for instance, you know, we've seen that at a global level, the per capita net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions increased uh, from you know, 7.7 .7 to 7.8 tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, during this period of 2010 to 2019. But then, of course, this average tells you very little. So you have to kind of delve deeper into regional differences. And then you see that, you know, for regions like Africa, Asia and developing Pacific and Latin America and Caribbean, the per capita emissions levels are still less than half of those of developed countries or developed regions like North America, Europe and so on. Uh, and then, you know, even if we look at cumulative emissions, uh, you know, th the three developing regions, they're starting from a smaller base uh, and smaller per capita. They grew by about 26 percent between 2010 and 2019, uh, whereas for developed countries, emissions contracted, but from, of course, a much higher level between uh, 2010 and 2019. And... Um, we also find that you know, for, for least developed countries and small island development states, uh, they've contributed less than half a percent to cumulative you know, historical emissions. And uh, you know, there is, of course, uh, you know, big, big differences even today in their present level. Um, then if we look also at the national level, we see that you know, there are, again, big differences. So at the half of the global population lives in countries emitting on average less than uh, more than six tons of CO2 equivalent per capita. But then you have 10% of the population in countries emitting more than 12 tons of CO2 per capita. And another 40% that live in countries that emit less than three tons of CO2 equivalent per capita. And these regions are those where you have a lot of extreme poverty, energy poverty, lack of decent living standards. And what there is, you know, what our findings are, are based on the literature re review is that eradicating extreme poverty, energy poverty, and providing decent living standards in all of these regions uh, it can be achieved without significant global emissions growth. Um, and then the final point is also that, you know, within regions and nations, there are vast differences in how much different households contribute. To global greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, globally, the top 10% of households that are the highest per capita emitters, they contribute about 40%, and then the bottom 50% only contribute about 15%. Yeah, that, those are those are astonishing uh, uh, numbers, actually, particularly on the distributional side. So, that if the bottom 50% only contribute 15%, uh, and as you say, that the um, uh, the the, the poorer regions of the world, the emissions are growing uh, because we're starting from a, a naturally, uh, they would be growing because you're starting from a lower base. It does raise important questions uh, about how we view the future and how we view um, what, uh, uh, what different parts of the world do and how we sort of, in a sense, assess uh, the basis for what they do. I think I also heard you say that in addition to distribution across regions, it's important to look at distribution within countries, and that is not uh, e equal equal either. One of the things that we've, we've heard in the commentary and from our colleagues in the report is that this report uh, has been unusual among IPCC reports in taking much more seriously questions of equity and, and, and justice. And I think part of what you're, part of the, the, the discussion of trends and drivers uh, exposes that. But maybe is that something you'd like to kind of elaborate a little bit more on in the context of the broader report? And, and I can also sort of fill in some details from my chapter, if that's useful. Yeah, thank you, Navroz. I think your chapter covered this in a lot of detail. Uh, as, as I mentioned, within chapter two, it's more sort of looking at current patterns and you know historical trends and so on. So the key points that I highlighted were sort of some of the major ones. But I think another part of the report that does a really good job at covering some of this is, uh, you know, overall, the report embeds climate mitigation efforts much more within the broader sustainable development framework. And I think that's a really important element uh, that uh, has been assessed within this report. And it really clearly shows that, 
you know, accelerated and equitable climate action in mitigating and adapting uh, is critical sus to sustainable development. And that, you know, there are sometimes trade-offs between climate mitigation and sustainable development, but these trade-offs of individual options can be managed through policy design. And, you know, basically attention to equity and inclusiveness through meaningful participation of all actors is really important uh, because, you know, without that, uh, you're not going to have the buy-in and acceptability for uh, much of the transportive change that's going to be required. But I think, Navroz, you've covered this a lot in your chapter, so I'm sure you can say much more about uh, the findings from there. No, I think I think I think you've laid out a lot of the a lot of the key a lot of the key points. Um, I think what what was interesting in the way in which this report addressed equity is it nodded to the fact that there is a global equity context, but the IPCC uh, uh, is not really the place to look at these kinds of negotiating considerations. But it does talk about the fact that uh, there that equity remains important to the global discussion that there are even, and this is true despite shifts in what is called differentiated responsibility, the understanding that different groups of countries have different responsibilities, as well as complexities in understanding how you assign, if you like, fair shares across emissions. Um, so all of these things, um, I think, I think the, the report recognizes, but what I found really interesting is uh, I think you put it well, Shanali, that the idea that if we don't think through equity implications and what happens to communities that are disrupted, uh, and there will be some disruptions, uh, as well as some benefits from uh, mitigation-related actions, and the report talks about this in the context of, of synergies and trade-offs, uh, but where there are those trade-offs, so for example, coal communities that uh, will lose their livelihoods over time uh, is an example, or uh, uh, poorer commuters who may suffer the impacts of higher fuel taxes is another example. Uh, then I think the, what the report says is that it's really useful and necessary to find ways of maintaining that social cohesion. And this is where my chapter, I think, had some interesting things to say, because what it says is that it is important to try and build institutions, build government bodies that are explicitly mandated to address these kinds of transition questions. So many countries in the world have built, uh, uh, have created just transition commissions uh, that are designed, in fact, to, um, to look at how this transition can happen in ways that don't impact uh, the poorest and, and, and place all the burden of them. So I think that's a very kind of heartening theme. And it is, it is I confess, personally, uh, uh, my hope that, that that's one of the themes the governments, uh, the governments pick up on. Uh, a little bit more. Um, I think it would be useful, Shanali, to, to, to also take this further uh, to pick up another one of your, the themes you highlighted on the sustainable development linkages. And actually, before we do that, maybe you could tell us, you know, stepping out of your IPCC role, tell us a little bit about the work of over your career, focusing on energy access issues and those sorts of questions, which I'm sure have, have, have informed your, your work in the IPCC. So maybe you know, put a small bracket around around this and talk about a little bit about your work and we'll come back and relate that to, to the perspective you bring to the IPCC. I've been working on energy transitions in the global south, I guess, for most of my career. And uh, uh, I really started into this topic because I was interested in understanding um, how big the issue of energy access or energy poverty was. And I started looking at this first for India during my PhD thesis work. And then of course it's kind of grown from there, but um, I was always interested in sort of understanding who's using what, why, uh, why are transitions not occurring more rapidly in certain parts of the world. Um, and then also kind of trying to understand what are the linkages of these transitions to sort of broader sustainable development? Um, so, for instance, you know, the, the strong linkage between access to clean cooking and, and indoor air pollution and health impacts, but also sort of gender equity and, uh, you know, sort of pulling people out of poverty, giving them the opportunities to have livelihoods and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it was always kind of this 
main focus on looking at energy transitions in, in the global south, uh, and then kind of embedding that within the broader sustainable development agenda and trying to look at interlinkages between how these transitions play out and what that means for other sustainable development goals. So, so that, I think that's, that's sort of, you know, great experience and background to bring uh, to this IPCC report because a central question really is, uh, given that climate uh, change is becoming so urgent, given that we're not on track, given that the emission trends are uh, still growing, but also given the fact that we have many countries struggling to develop, the SDGs are nowhere near met, uh, energy needs are still largely correlated with development outcomes in many parts of the world. How do you square this circle? In the sense, that's been the underlying question, it sounds like, for much of your career. Um, you know, given that context, how well do you think the IPCC helped square this circle? Uh, the circle that says we can find a way to both develop as well as reduce emissions or at least limit emissions more accurately because emissions will grow in some countries such as India. Uh, what do you think the sort of key messages were and how well did we do it and how, how convincing were we? You know, because ultimately governments and communities and others have to be convinced that in fact the, 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 the trade-offs are less than the synergies and that the trade-offs are manageable. Uh, what do you think we were able to give give the policymakers on this? Yeah, so Navroz, I mean, I think the report does a fantastic job of sort of laying out a lot of options. Uh, you know, yes, of course, it it's alarming in some ways because it's sort of saying the window of opportunity to do something is closing rapidly. But then it's really sort of laying out so many options for how governments can 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 make that transformation. I mean, you know, we, we, there's, there are huge findings in there about how there's been sustained decreases in the unis, unit cost of renewables like solar energy, wind energy, and even uh, iron lithium ion batteries. And, you know, the deployment has just grown so rapidly across regions recently. I mean, that's a really big success story that we're seeing happening. And then, you know, the whole focus on the demand side and the sociocultural factors in this report, I think is also a real innovation compared to previous reports, because it's really showing that, you know, if you get the infrastructure right, particularly in developing countries where this is going to grow rapidly, then you can really enable sort of low carbon lifestyles. And that, you know, if you do these demand side measures, then you can really, save 40 to 70 percent of your emissions by 2050 and you know there are whole you know slew of options there in the building sector in the transport mobility sector in the design of buildings so you know build you know building your cities in a way that people can can, can commute by foot or on bicycle you know that's a win-win-win on many many fronts um so I think there's really a lot that the report provides in terms of how the transformations can be made across the board in every sector uh, and also in terms of, you know, these opportunities and options on the demand side that can really bring a lot of benefit both in terms of climate mitigation, but then also things like health, uh, air pollution and, you know, a whole host of other developmental goals. Yes, I think I, 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 I really agree with you. I think this emphasis on the demand side is, is really important. Maybe I'll just kind of pause to put that in context for, for some of the readers. You know, much of the discussion on energy policy over the years has been on how you supply energy and how you do that in as green a form as possible. So moving from coal to renewable energy uh, uh, and then reducing your losses in terms of transmission and so on and so forth. So what Shanali is telling us about and what the report for the first time had a chapter on is on focusing on how many more options that also exist on the demand side. And this point that you made, Shanali, about avoiding locking in, I think is key. So for developing countries, the fact that infrastructure is yet to be built, our buildings are yet to be fully built, many more will be built, our transport networks are yet to be fully built. So we have an opportunity to avoid locking into high carbon futures uh, and actually directly leapfrogging to, to lower carbon uh, uh, demand patterns. I, I personally thought it was very interesting that the report 
was at pains to point out that this isn't only about asking individuals to change their behaviors. Yes, behavioral change is part of it, you know, taking a bus rather than using a private car, but critically that infrastructure and technology are enablers of behavior change. You can't people expect people to hop on a bus if buses are hot, infrequent, unreliable, unsafe, and so on. So the infrastructure has to be in place uh, as well, which I thought was, uh, was, was really uh, important. Um, I might just take the, the liberty of expanding on that a little bit with regard to, to my chapter. Uh, one of the interesting things that, that my chapter, building on the chapter called development, uh, which looked at development pathways, uh, which is chapter four in the report, argued is that actually when you step back and look at long-term development transitions, and this is not just in poor countries, developed countries, it's also in richer countries, decisions about how you are going to structure your economy, how you're going to provide jobs, how you're going to uh, design your recovery packages from COVID or from a financial crisis, all of these big picture things are also implicitly climate climate decisions, right? So if you do a rescue and recovery packages that, that focuses on infrastructure spending in order to boost an economy, you could choose to make that infrastructure spending focus on low carbon infrastructure, or you could use to build more roads and coal-fired power plants. And so there's a choice, uh, there's a choice over there, uh, how a country like India decides we're going to create jobs in the future and where we're going to strategically think the sunrise industries of the future are are also implicitly climate decisions. So I thought this was a, a landmark report in that sense, in that it opens the door to thinking about climate change in this much, much, uh, much, much broader, broader way. Uh, and I'm curious if you if you saw the report in, in a similar light, uh, Shanali. Yeah, absolutely, Navroz. I think this this sort of key underlying message throughout the report that sustainable development is critical to climate change is really you know very uh, key uh, finding and uh, important sort of framing to i think pretty much everything that's within the report and as you rightly say i mean pretty much every policy decision that we are making today even if it seems very far from uh, anything to do with climate mitigation actually has major implications for climate mitigation and you know how how uh, the future will unfold in this context. So, um, yeah, completely agree on that. Uh, I, I think that this is a really strong report in sort of bringing all these different elements together and highlighting uh, how important it is to sort of look at. And I think your your chapter, again, I think there says a lot that's really interesting in terms of how policy design needs to change to, to really take account of these interlinkages. Uh, maybe you want to say a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank, thanks, for the, thanks for the opening. I, I think that's right. I mean, you know, I, I sometimes feel with these reports that we, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we want to make sure that we signal directions forward, but we also don't want to oversimplify and make it sound like this is all straightforward. And one of the things that our chapter says is, look, we acknowledge that while there are these opportunities from opening the door and thinking about climate change in this more expansive way as part of mainstream decisions, taking advantage of those opportunities is obviously also more complex because suddenly the decision-making landscape changes. So the same chapter that I was involved in this time, I was also part of in the last IPCC, now some uh, almost a decade ago, really. And that chapter focused a lot on things like carbon taxes and cap and trade policies and so on, which are policies narrowly and squarely around reducing emissions. Now, suddenly we're saying urbanization policy is climate policy, building policy or transport policy is climate policy, even education policy is climate policy, uh, mainstream economic policy around stimulus is climate policy, job creation is climate policy. So all of these things obviously require much more attention to coordination between different parts of government. You can't just hive this decision off to a Ministry of Environment if you're also looking at job creation, for example. Um, so you need to coordinate across government. You need to be able to set long-term strategic visions. And as we discussed earlier, you need to be able to build consensus in ways that don't leave the poor and vulnerable uh, behind. 
So that's much more complex uh, governance that, that countries have to take on, which means they have to build the bodies within government uh, to do that. These might be knowledge bodies, these might be uh, um, uh, deliberative bodies to bring together those who will win and those who will be impacted by decisions. It might be in within government coordination structures to break silos. So, so in a weird kind of way, the climate, the scale of the climate challenge requires us to not just rethinking policy and combining policy to achieve these objectives, but also rethinking uh, government. Um, and so that's actually quite a high bar, um, but it's not something that we have to do right away. But I think the, the, the report suggests that governments start thinking about it uh, relatively soon. But I do want to acknowledge that therefore, the scope of what this report recommends is actually really quite substantial. And I, 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 uh, I, I don't know if, if Shonali, you, you, you find that, you know, um, a daunting kind of message uh, as well. And I, and I um, let me just let me just say we had a podcast, we had a webinar rather on on this report and a senior government official somewhat tongue in cheek said, well, it sounds like what we should be doing is just replacing all the government uh, uh, people with IPCC authors because they have all the answers. And um, I, you know, I thought there was a, there, it was a slightly, slightly stinging comment, but I think, you know, I think that, I think we have to take that, uh, that perspective uh, on board and figure out, you know, how do we break this problem up into you know, more manageable pieces than simply saying, look, change the way you do everything. And I'm curious if you have a reaction to that. Yeah, I think Navroz, you put it rightly. I mean, it seems daunting at some level, but you know, there are things that can happen even now that perhaps is not happening as as much as we ought to be, you know, uh, that it ought to be happening. So, for instance, you know, we've talked for years and decades now on monitoring and evaluation of policies, for instance. And, you know, we still do this in such a incomplete fashion. Uh, we are, we're always looking only at primary objectives of the policies. We're not looking at sort of the wider impacts of the policies, uh, uh, so, you know, we, you know, if it's a, if it's a policy on electrification, for example, we're only looking at numbers of connections. We're not looking at the quality of supply or the affordability of the supply or any of those kind of things that we ought to be looking at. So, I mean, I think it's, it's sort of these smaller things that, uh, we kind of know we need to be doing, uh, but we're not always doing, uh, that can kind of quite quickly happen and can then start informing this sort of more um, coordinated and integrated policy action that's needed for um, addressing these issues. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's challenging, no doubt. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's going to take time and effort. But I mean, if, if people are behind the ideas, then, then of course it can happen. I, I like that very much. I like the fact that uh, you know you you you've singled out a few concrete things that actually may not be that challenging, and that's probably not a great excuse for not doing it right away. And I would add to your list of you know monitoring and evaluation of, of policies. You know, just creation of knowledge institutions that start asking the question um, where uh, which technologies and which ways forward are more likely to create jobs, which are most synergistic with solving air pollution. These are things that we should be building our information on and feeding it into the policy process. And there's not really a reason for us, uh, uh, you know, not to be not to be uh, in, in engaging in those in those in those basic things. So, so I think that's I think that's very helpful uh, to identify a few concrete things to get away from a message that says change everything you do about everything, um, which which there's a risk that the report could be could be read that way. And I and I think breaking it into bite sized pieces is is very is very helpful. Um, look, uh, you know, I think we're almost out of time here. I think this has really been a, a wonderful conversation. I do want to give you a couple of minutes, uh, uh, Shanali, uh, to express, uh, you know, both as a as an IPCC author, but also as somebody who's a uh, uh, you know who has deep experience and and academic and personal roots in India, uh, to tell us, um, uh, uh, you know, what what you hope. Um, this report can help stimulate in terms of in terms of changes. Now we all 
uh, have in, internalized the fact that we have to be policy relevant and not policy prescriptive, and we can't tell particular governments what to do. But I think even within those confines, I think we can share some of our our dreams and our hopes coming out of this report. And I'd really welcome uh, uh, welcome yours. Yeah, thanks, Navroz. I mean, I think you know we we've said it all pretty much. You know, we have options in all sectors, and we know that we need to be doing transformations in all sectors. And I think uh, you know while of course. Uh, that there's less financial cap capacity, perhaps, uh, or technical capacity in some cases in you know least developed countries or developing countries. Um, the options are well known, and and you know we know that the next few years are critical. So we really need to be sort of moving much faster than we have in the past, uh, unless we want to sort of lose this opportunity that we have to you know do deep reductions in all sectors and i mean i think as you rightly pointed out a critical element to sort of getting people on board and just having these kind of transformative policies accepted is to have a special focus on equity and inclusiveness in all of this so you know if we have the stakeholders on board and 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 are able to understand their concerns and, and where they may potential trade-offs and how to address those trade-offs, then there's going to be buy-in for the change. There's no doubt about that. So, I mean, I think those are sort of the things that I that give me hope and I think uh, hopefully can move us forward. Thank you, Ishali. I think it's, it's, it's great to, 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 um, uh, to take that thought uh, forward. I, I do want to pick up one more thing uh, that you said before we close, and that is, you know, you also talked about the fact that uh, while there are all these opportunities, there there are uh, there is a need for enabling those opportunities, including through uh, sort of deliberately thinking about equity. But also, you mentioned finance, and I think that was another important theme. The report that we would do well to just flag that, and neither of us were directly involved in that in that part of the conversation. But our colleagues in that chapter did note that flows are currently a factor of three to six below the levels needed by 2030 uh, to limit warming and that those uh, the, the 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 level uh, below which flows are necessary are even greater in developing country regions so that's another part of the story that i think is, is directly salient uh, to policymakers so we have a we have a, a narrative of a lot of uh, you know of, of time actually running short a lot of opportunities concrete things governments can do, concrete things the international community can do, including thinking through the, the shortage in, in flows. Um, and uh, probably an important first step to start discussing these ideas more. And um, I'm really grateful, uh, Shanali, I'm gonna end with the honorific, Dr. Pachori, that you have, were able to join us and uh, stimulate uh, this conversation. And we look forward to hearing from you again on this podcast. And me personally, uh, I look forward to working with you uh, uh, again uh, on this and other issues. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Navnoz. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for listening. For more information on our work here at the Center for Policy Research, follow us on Twitter at CPR underscore India and log on to our website at www.cprindia.org. Thank you again for listening and tune in back uh, to for our other episodes of the CPR podcast. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.